Uh, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Vernick, though I'm sure she does not need an introduction at all, um, to IHPI seminar. Um, she is the director of RESDAC, and to me it's more important than even being the senior assistant dean of <laughs> School of Public Health. Uh, for those of you, I'm sure there are many among the audience who work with Medicare and Medicaid claims data. Um, I know we know about RESDAC. I called them so many times that in one of the conferences, they kind of recognized me. We were talking and said, oh, you're the one who always talk about the cost and call us day and night. And um, so um, anyway, um, without further ado, um, I will let Dr. Wernick Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. I've really enjoyed my, my time visiting everybody, and I've um, got to admit, you can warn the people from Minnesota, I, I will go into the office on Monday morning with the, the word, phrase they hate more than anything, which is, I've got some ideas. Um, so um, I really appreciate all of your openness and questions and ideas and chance to talk about science, because that's I, I would say sort of the fun part of my job, and so this has been a nice opportunity. So to, I actually use this as a chance to sort of do some self-reflection. So what I started to think about when I was getting ready to do this talk is what is it that I really like to do and want to do more of, and how is it I want to approach the part of the world that I study? And so this really is sort of some examples of how I see that and why I see it, and so it's not necessarily comprehensive, it's not always even the most current stuff I'm doing, but it's really just more to talk about how I'm thinking about things. So one of the questions that I've gotten very interested in is whether it's patient factors or provider factors that are driving healthcare use, sort of who's driving the bus. And um, so, and, and when you think about that, that's, it's not just an academic, question, it's actually, if we sort of sometimes say, as I think we all do, I'm, getting, I'm really frustrated with the patterns that I see, they don't seem right, they ought to be different, we should be doing a better job. I mean, I think many of us have thought those things when doing our research. Um, getting back to the sort of the causal model, if you will, is, is beca can become really important to sort of say, how can we create an evidence base that would allow us to more effectively identify the type of intervention, policy, big P policy, little p policy, that would actually change the patterns we're seeing. So um, that's really what I looked at. So if you think about PCORI and patient-centeredness, one of the questions that, that I often find myself asking is, is patient-centeredness really the model of how healthcare is being done? Is it patient-centeredness? Is patient-centeredness more of a, of a goal than a reality or is, in fact, patient-centeredness and are, in fact, patient preferences really what's driving? So if you think about the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, they will often say, and for this usually massive group, we don't know, go talk to your doctor and explain your preferences. Right? We've, seen, we've all seen those guidelines that say, talk to your doctor. And so the question is, well, is that really happening? Are we seeing signs that it's really patient preferences that are driving decision-making? Um, you know, or are the providers applying their own standards? So if any of you have read back from the 70s, back when they were psychologists, Kahneman and Tversky, they were really about physicians as decision makers who were in fact human and subject to their own biases and understanding their biases and being able to work with them. So in fact, is, should that be our model of how we approach things? So. You know, if we think about things like overuse, low-value health care, um, choices, how, do we, how does under, this understanding help us ask insightful questions and ultimately point to policies or strategies that work? And then in some cases, and I get accused of this somewhat regularly, is that I'm blaming physicians for their patients. And in some of the cases, it's a little ridiculous, I think, like um, the cases where they say, no, the reason they didn't get a lymph node when they were doing their breast cancer surgery is because a patient refused it. And I, see, and I said to you, they really, they wanted the surgery, but they just said you couldn't take that sentinel lymph node? Like, that doesn't make total sense to me. 
you know, so are we, in, is that just an excuse or is in fact how, we, how are patient preferences and how is our understanding of them going to feed into what we do next? So the Medicare data. Now, I just as a as just as a sort of a disclaimer, I use lots of other data besides Medicare. I've done surveys, I do focus groups, but I'm going to focus on that today, the Medicare data today, um, just because of the ResDAC connection and because a lot of how I'm approaching this, this is a good way to think about it. So the Medicare program right now, just so you know, has 53, about 50.3 million elders aged 65 and older. So it's a big population. So some of you, when you're dealing with clinical studies and we worry about low power, well, the problem you're going to have with this data is the opposite. You're going to find things that are statistically significant that are completely uninteresting because we've got hyper-precision. But if you think about it in terms of variation, we've got 33, they, in the last year they had statistics, 3392 short-stay hospitals were reimbursed, um, 1,300 critical access hospitals, and 1.2 5 million providers, individual providers were reimbursed by the program. So that means you actually can start dividing out variants and you can start looking at things. And so that is sort of the background. The other context, and I don't know if you're used to this slide, is healthcare inflation. So the top line is total national healthcare expenditures. The bottom line, I'll get back, is um, Medicare expenditures. So we can certainly argue that the Medicare expenditures have been controlled more effectively, or at least the inflation perhaps, than healthcare overall. But we can also see that it's, it's definitely these, we would like to be curving both of those curves, just bending them down just at least a little bit. And so that's the motivation for policy. And there's certainly a lot going on at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, around trying to bend those curves while still not impact and quality. So we want to do the both. We want to, we want to get more for less, better, better with savings. And so understanding that and understanding that motivation becomes very important as well. So when I look at it, you know, here's where we are. 60% of the Medicare population is enrolled in traditional Medicare fee-for-service. So it's about 38 million people. So um, in the managed care and counter data were released in 2018, I talked with some of the analysts briefly at lunchtime about those data. And um, so, but the answer is the very large volume means you can look at really, really rare things. We can look at healthcare use for people over the age of 90. In clinics, that's really tricky, but we can look at it. We can look at, we can take an example and say, well, there's actually a small population where we can get the pure control we want and we can do it and not worry that we're studying, comparing 11 people to 10 people. Um, because, we can, because both facilities and providers bill, we actually can understand who's doing what. And we can, so we can identify, for example, the surgical team. We can put together, this is a hospital, this is a surgeon, this is the pathologist, this is the anesthesiologist. And we can start to understand those teams. So even if we want to look at something like a, com a complex interplay, between different professionals, we often have the chance to do it, or at least try to do it some of the time. And so, and again, we have more statistical power than we know what to do with. So that combination is both exciting and sometimes a little terrifying because there's so many cases, as I said at lunch, you know, SAS doesn't ever return an error that says, this was too dumb of a request for me to process. <laughs> Try again. So we've all had it where we get a table out. At least I think we have. Please tell me I'm not alone. And we're spending some time. We're looking at it. And we come up with this like great understanding. And then you discover it was actually a coding mistake. And we weren't looking at what we thought we were. But the numbers were so compelling that we got completely distracted for sometimes a way too long. So that's one of the challenges we've got to face that we don't face with chart review data where we know exactly which patient we, we abstracted. But it's also hard, or harder than we would like it to be. So rarely do Medicare data, or in administrative data, not just Medicare, Medicaid, HCUP, Optum, contain the exact variables I want in the format I want. So what that means is we need to be creative and we need to understand the rules. So for example, you know, I, I was working with some epidemiologists, says, well, where's the hypertension variable? Like, what? 
Like there is no hypertension variable that we don't create ourselves. So the challenge with that is that we have to create it, and we, which means we have to stop and we have to understand, we have to do it right. Um, one of the other questions that came up on lunch was, at lunch was like, can we trust what other people do? So you know, you find these algorithms, like can I just use their algorithm or do I have to create my own? And, and again, you know, the answer is always like, trust but verify a little bit. But the other piece of it is, is how do we identify our at-risk population? So if we're thinking about these as many experiments that are going on in the world, setting up the experiment is really where we need to be spending our time. And there's a lot of opportunity, but it's also the place where we need the most creativity and we need to spend the most time. And, but again, so I personally, and you'll see this, I'm a big fan of stratification, more than I ever thought I was when I was learning the mantle hansel chi-square test by hand. But um, in fact, that's often the way that we can see the variability rather than, so I'm, you'll notice this, that I'm going to be much more of a, of a stratifier than a modeler. And that's just my bias. But again, we each can do it. But again, you will see that you've got variation. And because of the volume, you can use that to your advantage to try to ask insightful questions that bring our knowledge forward. So I'm going to go through three examples now. And what, they're, what they are is sort of examples of the types of questions that I've asked and answered. And, but they're also examples of the sorts of things that I'm continuing to do. So just to sort of to make sure it's clear. So the first, one of the first ones is about geography as a source of variation and about using geography. So, you know, geography is destiny. And we, urban rural is one of the easiest ways to think about it. And in a state like Michigan, which has got rural populations and urban populations, understanding those differences becomes really important. And it's also hard because overall, the urban population is always bigger than the rural population, which means if you're not thinking about it, it's really easy to get your statistics swamped by the average urban effect and miss something that's going on for a small number of people. And that was actually something that came up. I was doing, I, I, because I'd studied hospice, um, I was invited out to the group of hospice providers and somebody pulled me aside and told me that I really didn't understand the whole thing and that there was this bigger problem that I wasn't seeing. It wasn't race, it wasn't gender, it was geography, and that I'd missed it. And so, you know, like all of you guys, when you get those, you take a challenge. You're like, I didn't miss it, I just hadn't looked yet, and I'm gonna look now. So there. And so, um, so this is what's going on. So hospice, so with hospital service areas, basically anyone can go to a hospital. So most of the hospital service areas, if you think like Dartmouth Atlas, the ge each zip code is assigned to where the plurality of patients come from. So there is no zip code in the United States that isn't assigned to a hospital, okay? But hospice is the reverse. It's supposed to be home-based, which means instead of the people going to the center, the center has to go to the people. And so, and while there are hospice homes and in institutional-based hospice, it's still supposed to be, and it is designed and is reimbursed to be largely home-based. And then it turns out in the regulation, hospices are generally required to be able to reach their patients within an hour. So the interesting conversations around like LA, which I am not dealing with, because in fact you cannot get from one end of LA to the other in an hour, even in the middle of the night. So they actually had to adapt their hospices accordingly. So the question would be, are there places that are so remote that nobody has ever received home-based hospice? So that, in fact, no one can get, none of the hospices are close enough to get to them within an hour. So if they were to get hospice care, they would have to go, they would have to move to an institutional setting, which means they would, which again means they are going to be an hour from their community, from their family and everything else, because there's no way for the hospice to meet regulation. So that, translating that to, re, to, to data, what we translated it to is, are there places where no one has received home-based care in a three-year period, okay? Because that's, because again, we have to operationalize it with the data. And so we don't, so like, so people say, well, yeah, it's possible. I'm like, well, have you ever done it? No, why not? Well, it's too far, so it's really not possible. What's, you know, so that's the question of what can we do as a surrogate for possible? And that was part of our question of is that, does that rule work? Can we use it? Can we make a rule that would work with the data that can also match reality. 
So what we did is we started with the state of Minnesota, which like Michigan has got a mix of urban, semi-urban, rural, large, small. And we said, well, we're gonna see if we can figure it out for Minnesota and then see if we can, in fact, extrapolate to the rest of the US. So what we did is we called every hospice in the state and asked them where they served. And we did it by just saying, do you have a service area? And then we had a map and like, do you go to War Road? Do you go to Thief River Falls? Do you go to Pelican Rapids? And we would outline their each hospice's service area manually and then we layered them all and we got the red, the red sections, which were places in Minnesota where there was no hospice. We then asked whether or not we could get the same patterns from the Medicare data. So we had to do a little cleaning. So we had to, first of all, we worried about people whose mailing address and um, home address didn't match. So we got rid of everybody where it looked like the hospice traveled more than five hours. So we got rid of the people whose address was in Minnesota and who were getting hospice care in Arizona. We did not believe that was actually, that one of the two, that, that we believed that the resident or the patient was, was wrong in those cases. And we were, and then we actually ran this past the hospices and said, just to reverse this out, this is what we're finding. Do you agree? And in some cases, there were really odd things, and I apologize to the audio tape, but. So do you see this, this red splotch here? It's right between three hospices. It's actually less than an hour from a lot of places, but we found it as not getting any hospice. And so that one, we thought our algorithm didn't work. And so we made some phone calls, and it turned out it's more than an hour south of Duluth. So the Duluth hospice, which is big, wouldn't go there. It turned out the Mora hospice, which is sort of the south, is a county-based hospice, which means they do not cross county lines. And you get, this, you get these circles. If you think about where you put circles together, and you occasionally will get these little squares where none of the circles overlap. And we found that with the data, and we confirmed it with phone calls, which said, OK, maybe, maybe we're on to something. And so that is an example both of how it can be really hard to do the mapping work, but also really exciting. But what we concluded at the time is the good news is the majority of Medicare beneficiaries reside in areas served by hospice. But that's actually not surprising because the majority of Medicare beneficiaries reside in urban areas. And so that we've, we know of no urban area unserved. So by definition, number one, we knew before we started any work. And, but we also found that there were, in fact, a large number of large but very sparsely populated areas in the U.S. that were not served by hospice. I could not, the map is getting it squeezed and I couldn't find the original. And we actually started looking at the finances of it and realized that, that from a financial standpoint and a reimbursement structure, that the small hospices, when we were talking to them, really are in shaky ground. For hospice to break even, as somebody said, you know, hospice is managed care for dying people. You've got to have some number of patients in order to maintain your expense structure. And for a lot of these rural areas, they were never going to have enough deaths at the same time to handle their expense structure. And so it's so the so the host, so part of the problem has to do with the payment mechanisms. And so we raised that and started saying, well, you know, maybe like critical access hospitals, we need to have critical access hospices that would say, we, if we really value this, we need to be paying people differently and we need to be acknowledging that they're serving, a, we need to give them some, a break on something, either on the rules or on staffing or something. We also worked with the hospices. One of the pieces they said is, you know, if you only have one staff person and that person were like to take a day off, it's really hard. So we talked about, and we for a while we're working toward getting a statewide hospice float pool. So you could say, okay, you, somebody wants to take a vacation, we can help you find hospice staff that actually know what they're doing, who would be willing to spend, you know, a week up in War Road, which is that sort of the bump up going into Canada, and you could do that. But ultimately, what we've concluded is that, and it hasn't changed. But the pay without changes to the payment rules, there is absolutely no way that this pattern will change. And this work was done a few years ago, and it, ha it has not changed. We kinda, I kind of keep an eye on it and 
from time to time in Minnesota in particular, ask if anyone's doing anything. And again, it's just the math of understanding the areas and documenting it and raising it as an urban-rural issue. So the next study is one where we're trying to understand whose incentives. So when you get these examples where the incentives would point in opposite directions, it's kind of, they, they, there's this natural experiment to say, well, which incentives are lining up with the, obser with the observations? And so the example, this was one that one of my students did for her dissertation, and it was about hip replacements. And there's two devices for hip fracture. Are there any orthopedists in here? Okay, in that case, yes, no? Okay, good. Then I can tell you, okay, I'll probably, there are two devices for fracture repair. There are nails and screws. And what's interesting about them is that they are different reimbursements, so physicians are actually paid more to do nails than to do screws. The, device, the nails cost more as a device, but the hospitals, because they use the same DRG code, are paid exactly the same for both. So from a hospital's perspective, more expensive device and equal payment, you're better off. The hospital should be wanting screws because that would be, cost them less. The physicians should be wanting nails because they'll get paid more and they don't have any device responsibility. So the question was, what are we, who's, whose incentives seem to be working? And so we looked at the Medicare data because we have lots of cases. We identified surgeries and what was interesting, so, so we started with the hospital data because we, would, we expect by definition all of these should be hospitalized. The hospital billing doesn't distinguish between the two. As I said, they're paid the same and in fact if you look at the hospital claims you cannot tell which one somebody got. So we took the hospital codes, hospital billing, and we grabbed everybody who had a 81.51, which is a hip replacement. We then went and we linked in the surgeons. So we had to find the surgeons for all of those, ho all of those hospitalizations because the surgeons would tell us what exactly they did. They had two CPT codes, 27245 and 27244. And so that's, how, that's an example of how we can put it together and understand the structure of the data and the payment structures to really try to figure this out. So we had 192,000 surgeries. We had 15,000 surgeons and 3,400 3, hospitals. So really, I mean, like surprisingly large numbers. And you're like, okay, we, like, you can do something with these numbers, and that's part of it where you can sort of, these are why the natural experiments are so much fun because they're true experiments, and you can cut it, and you can ask questions, um, not all of which we asked. But one, so here's what we found. We found that younger surgeons, so we linked with, with the um, AMA data, and those who, who worked in a greater number of hospitals over a three-year period were more likely to use nails, okay? DOs, doctors of osteopathy, which was, this was not one we expected, actually were more likely to use nails than, physicians, than MDs. I don't completely understand that one, but it's, it is absolutely correct. Teaching hospitals used more nails than non-teaching hospitals. And nail use increased over the period. And our best model actually included a surgeon random effect. And I tell you that because it just says the surgeon, the surgeon him or herself actually matters. It's not just a, if, so there is some component there. And what, did it, what we actually concluded after talking with people and running a, a few more models is that there's a training phenomenon here. So, so surgeons, one of the things you'll see with surgeons in training is they'll often go to multiple hospitals, much more so than somebody once they're settled into practice. And we think that's why we found the multiple hospitals effect is again, it was just another marker of recent training. But it also, so it's, so in that case, you know, the question is what it points to is, is that teaching hospitals want their surgeons to be able to use all devices and may in fact preferentially use one that's less common to make sure that the people who they train are well versed in it. Um, but what, they, what we don't consider is that as those people then are sent off into the community, so we have another paper in the series, what you'll see is you'll see this diffusion of innovation and you'll see non-teaching hospitals slowly picking it up. So um, it's a little bit like if you've seen those, you know, on the movies where they show the pandemic spread and it starts from a few cities and it slowly goes and pretty soon the whole country is taken up. Well, just like influenza, so are nails. Um, but so those are some of the things and it, it, we have not taken on and looked at, you know, 
is this an orthopedic issue or is this really how training works and training as a mechanism for diffusing cutting edge, cutting edge technology? I think that's the, the higher level question coming up is, is this one example that was sort of interesting and the orthopedic surgeons found it fascinating or is there a bigger story about how people learn and how the way we train affects the way people practice? The final example I'm going to talk about is androgen sup suppression therapy, or AST, also sometimes called ADT. And it's recommended use for men newly diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and this is not my work. It's a co colleagues actually from. Um, and what they found is that over a very short period of time, um, AST use was just taking off. Was, and CMS got very worried about it because they are a primary reimburser of the therapy and they were not happy with how much they were spending and they caught it. So they said as part of the, the 2003 Medicare Modernization Act, they reduced um, AST reimbursement by 64% over a two-year period. Okay, so the questions we had were, well, one is sort of the no-brainer, did it change things? And we expect it would, right? I mean, that's why they reduced the payment. I mean, so did it actually change use? But the real question that we asked is, well, did it have unintended consequences? So if it just changed use overall, that means that some people who would actually benefit from the therapy because of the price change weren't getting it. And yes, people who would, wouldn't benefit weren't getting it, but there'd be a, the price might be too high if we consider the indicated use. So we wanted to ask both, like, did it do what it did? And we, we went in with like a really strong prior there, but our real question was about the unintended consequences. And we're, and this is, was particular, a particularly dramatic decline in pricing happening very rapidly. It's not usually what CMS does. And so it was an interesting chance to ask what happened. And so what we found here, and you can see, so this is the payment, this dotted line here, and you can see it just fell off. So it's pretty stable and it fell off. This is use for metastatic patients. And the good news was, although it's stabilized, it didn't really fall with the drop in payment. These are non-indicated non -indicated use, low-risk patients. And in fact, what we see is it did drop. It didn't drop as much as I think everybody hoped, <coughs> but it dropped. Okay, and um, so those are, so the answer was sort of an interesting one of it looks like in this case that for our low risk patients, use at least stabilized and dropped off a bit. For our high risk patients where it's indicated, it was, it dipped a little bit, but not as much that we'd worry about, which would suggest that for patterns like this, it might be safe to really pull back reimbursement dramatically and not worry about unintended consequences. Of course, the challenge with this is that this is one example, right? So these are cases where we can see what we can do, we can, we're excited about it, and the question is how can we replicate it, and how can we find other examples that allow us to test this idea where there are relatively clear guidelines so we can actually say intended or unintended, and we, can, and we have the data to do it. So there was a slide that is missing. Well, we'll just go through it. So when we think about these, these studies, and, and there are a number that, that, are, that have also published, there are a number that are in the works, some of the things that, that, that allow this, and this is for all of you as well, is first of all that we have a long time period, which means we can actually see pre-thing pre while it's happening and post, and so we actually get that time series so we can think about different, you know, different models. So Medicare data currently are 1999 through 2017. Sierra Medicare currently, I believe, is 1991 through 2016. So again, we've got these long horizons to look at effects and to get these trajectories so that we can be sure that we're not reacting to one data point shifting, but, but we can look at it and we can look at those changes. Um, the, well, I'll talk about the downside next slide. We've got really large volume, and that's fantastic, and that really allows us to do things that we couldn't do. You know, 192,000 surgeries over a three-year period means we actually can look at things 
and we don't worry that if one person had made a different decision that our effect would be reversed. Um, and it allows us to do things like random intercepts, you know, random slope models. We can do our modeling and we can use all of our statistical ability to try to break things out. It also means we can stratify. So if we have a hypothesis that says, well, there are, I expect different differences between urban rural or between different age groups, we actually have enough power that we can legitimately look into them. And, and that's good. And, and that's, again, the variability. There, there are multiple sources of variation which allow us to sort of really understand these, these mechanisms. We don't have to do something like when the policy changed, was there less use? But we can actually start asking the questions we want to ask, like was there preferentially less use in certain circumstances? Was it according to indication? Was it according to race? Was it according to age? What type of facility? Whether or not it was a training facility? And we can ask those questions to really start to come up with some strong hypotheses about what is going on that might point us to what is the right strategy for certain types of things. Um, consistency. And, and I really want to emphasize that. So the Medicare program had, uses the same rules nationally. The rules may change year to year, but, they are, but they are, there's a national set of rules. And what that means is that if I find geographic variation, I don't have to worry that maybe it's because the reimbursement rules are different in Montana than they are in Michigan, and maybe it's, it's just a difference in reimbursement. So just to give you sort of a really concrete example of that, with the new encounter data, which is the Medi Medicare managed care, one of the things that we noticed is that we were seeing bills for ice packs in the ER. Now, Medicare fee-for-service would never in a million years pay for an ice pack. It would be bundled into the payments. So when the ER gets paid, that global payment includes an ice pack and aspirin and all sorts of stuff like that. And so we don't even look for that. We would never see it if, it, if somebody tried to get paid for it, it would be rejected. When the encounter data, we're seeing ice packs. We're like, what? Like, we, we didn't even know to, what they were. I mean, like, we've never seen that code. So we started making some phone calls, and it turns out some plans allow, allowed for that level of detail. Like they actually required that level of details. Others didn't. So what it meant is that if I wanted to study ice packs in the ER, right, and say I think that's my new quality measure, I wouldn't be able to differentiate between they didn't get an ice pack or they got it and it was just bundled in some global payment. So that consistency means that in those cases, the inference is really challenging because we don't quite know what it means. We know what it means to have it, so I'm really confident that the people who have ice packs had ice packs. But I don't know what, whether the people who didn't have a bill for ice packs got one and it was just rolled in or whether they never got one in the first place. Now, you're going to say, you're sitting back there going, like, who cares about ice packs? But you can imagine there are other bundling rules, like biopsies, pre-op physicals, pre-op checkups, post-op checkups, where that same phenomenon is happening. And so the consistency, whether we like the rules or not, at least what we know is we know that if we're seeing variation nationally, it's not that. Okay, so one source of possible error, one source of, of nuisance variation is removed. There are standard billing forms. And there are standard and, and I would argue, documented coding rules. You sometimes have to dig a bit, but they are documented somewhere. And in terms of the detail, you know, my general rule is if it, if it impacts billing, if you get paid differently because of it, it will be there. And so the good news is, is that most of the things that impact payment are things we, we're interested in anyway. So this is one of those, even if you don't study money, where the incentives are lined up. But Sometimes it feels like, how many of you remember this from algebra, right? Where you didn't know how tall the tree was or the building was, so you held up a yardstick and you measured the length of the yardstick and then you measured the shadow of the building because you couldn't actually measure the building, right? Because our tape measures weren't long enough and we don't let fifth graders on roofs of buildings. So, but this is in fact what we end up doing in the Medicare data. We, we can't measure things directly a lot of the time. So what we end up doing is indirect measurement. So it means we need to be creative but it also means we need to be aware. 
And that, so this is the fun for me. This is always a challenge of, okay, I, let me think how I can measure what is unmeasurable. But it's also my challenge of, let me make sure that I've really thought about it enough and carefully enough that I am sure that my inference is more likely than not, I mean, we don't have to do any more than that, to be right. And that's the challenge with these data. But it's, again, it's also the opportunity and the fun. So, you know, bottom line, these are not data. I get these calls sometimes, and like, I'm a resident in, I'll pick a department where nobody's here, I think that's orthopedics today, and <laughs> abstracts are due Thursday. Can you help me do a paper using Medicare data? And I'm like, they, no, <laughs> go away. You know, you're, you're two years too late. Um, but I mean, these are, you cannot rush. I, I tell my students, you know, when they do their three paper exams, which is what I usually have them do, you know, the first paper will take eight months, the second paper will take four months, and the third paper will take six weeks, right? Because getting the data in place, understanding it, understanding the coding, figuring it out takes a long time. Once you get through that, that once you get through all that cleaning and that understanding, it's, you can get a lot done, but there's always this huge learning curve. Um, you, need to ch you need to create variables, as I said, the coding rules change over time. So one of the things I told the analysts that I've learned, honestly, the hard way, is we always now plot time trends, often by quarter and minimum by annually. So because things change. And sometimes weird things. One of my students who I've talked to a couple of you about was plotting use of a medication. And it's kind of going along. And all of a sudden, it just like dropped. And it went back up. And I'm like, it's like, OK, what did you do wrong? You know, these poor students, they always get chewed out by me. She's like, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm like, well, this is not a normal pattern to have use drop by 90% in one quarter and then go back up. Something happened. We missed some data. And it turned out that CMS dropped a code for a quarter and then just realized their mistake and put it back in. And it wasn't her mistake, but it's like, OK, now. But then we found the code that they were using, and she was able to get her curve to straighten out. But those are the sort of things that just, when you're, when you're rushing to a deadline for an abstract or something else, just cause everybody's blood pressure to rise. But the, also the rule is there's a learning curve, but it never goes away. So it's not like I can now do these in two days and, every, you know, and it takes everybody else. It always takes time. So the complexity we can use to our advantage, but we have to be willing to recognize that there's complexity and, and, and not be caught by it. Um, there definitely is a huge amount, as I know many of you know, about pattern recognition. There will be certain patterns we'll do a frequent, like, okay, that's wrong. We know the second we see it that this is not the shape of, of, a, of a reimbursement curve for hospitalizations. We don't need to double check it. It just is. And so that's the advantage of the experience is that you can usually figure these things out faster. Um, computing time, I don't know. I mean, I think computing time can be long. And so, you know, I'm sure you've figured out the same thing we have. Like, we'll often run it on an OBS equals 1,000 just to make sure that the code works before we, you know, set the computing and then go to lunch and happy hour and breakfast and then hope it's back. Um, and again, we always get results. And that's actually the piece that always scares me the most is, you know, we always get results and we often have two-tailed hypotheses which means we're always happy with whatever we got, and we can usually come up with a really interesting story, which may or may not be right. And um, I've talked with our statisticians about whether they could come up with a term. So I've, I've had, over the years, numerous articles with editors saying, I will not give you p-values because I don't think they, they're really the appropriate statistic. There's too much precision here, and I don't believe that for people over age 90, we should be measure, measuring their age in months. So I'm not going to give it to you. I, I'll admit I usually lose those, so we've started now rounding our units to the units that we think are credible. So if I think I'm, if I'm worried about too much precision for age, I will only code it as five-year age groups because then I'm happy reporting it. But in fact, the downside of if you're not really sort of thinking about it is you can end up in some really funky boxes where you're having to explain something that you don't really think has any like practical significance. So, you know, so in short, these data are really fun, okay? That means you can ask questions and you can answer questions that are really not answerable other ways. And that's what's exciting is that if you think about layering, 
qualitative data, chart review data, and national Medicare data, you, all, you will come together to sort of focus on what we think is probably going on. And the, the ability to do that is really exciting. And I think challenging, and it's, it's the reason I use the data. It's the reason I enjoy it. It definitely requires a level of precision and patience that um, I don't think I appreciated when I first started using these data. And so I'm not trying to be sort of negative when I say this, but you really, this is, that's really sort of the biggest downside. And it's very complex, but in fact, you know, I've gotten accused a few times saying, well, these are only descriptive. You can't test hypotheses with these data because, I don't know, you can't. And I, and I would respectfully disagree. I think part of what's really fun about these is you can use these for hypothesis testing. You can use these for model calibration. And that what it really depends on is whether you had the hypothesis before or after you got the answer, to me at least, which is the question of whether it's descriptive or not. It's really how we approach it as scientists, not where the data came from. As one of my early mentors said, the data are the data. The data don't care. It's what you do with the data that makes it a good study or not. And I guess what I'd say is with Medicare data, I think that's probably the way to think about it. So I just want to acknowledge I, am, I do not work alone. I'm actually not allowed to do programming anymore because I've gotten so rusty I make too many mistakes. And um, so these are some of the people I work with, um, Helen and Steph, Shirley, Sean Elliott, Todd Tuttle, Mary Forty, and there's others that I work with as well. And so I just want to acknowledge that both so you can see how these do. These are definitely a group activity. Um, if the slides gets passed out, here are the references for the papers that I was talking about. And then um, any questions, comments, thoughts, disagreements? savings for Medicare, and hopefully it's, uh, uh, it's a reusable data, like they can redo the data and validate the findings and everything. Is there, what, what's the mechanism for the, for the Medicare to <coughs> pay attention to the findings based on Medicare claims data to save money? Um, an example would be the nail team or many of these surgical procedures that we know the literature that the outcomes are the same, but the cost savings is there and it's substantial. So, um, if, so the question is how do we get CMS's attention? And there are, there are a few ways depending on what you do. So there's CMS has a coverage group and that group definitely comes, handles some utilization management. So they will help with, so the Medicare, because it's a federal program, to make changes to the program actually require a congressional mandate. So it's, it was, in, for those of you who don't know, the reason they were so slow to flu shots is because originally when the statute was passed, it was not to provide preventive care, it was to provide acute care. And so slowly, to get the flu shots passed, it actually took an act of Congress. It didn't just feel like it, it actually was it. And so one of the things that happened is there were, we had to make, the evidence base had to be made that this was enough of a savings that they were willing to do it. And so from the nine, early 90s, when I started working with the data, there was no preventive, there were no preventive services covered. And now there are a large number of them that are covered, including cancer screenings and other screenings and the welcome to Medicare visit. So it's definitely been a pivot as I think both our understanding of healthcare and understanding that preventive care is in fact a way to control healthcare costs. Um, so the coverage group is sometimes a way that we have brought things, that I've personally brought things to CMS's attention. Um, the, but CMS does watch the literature I mean, and I'll admit that sometimes in my ResDAC role, so again, as that contractor, we'll sometimes point things out, like, you know, this is really interesting, and you know, we might point it out differently if we think it seems like it was done really well or if we're really not sure it was done, but if we're starting to hear things, we're starting to hear 
chatter that like this approach or this question, we're getting a lot of people interested in it. We'll let them know and we'll say, you know, we're, there's a lot going on here and there's a lot of movement and, you know, we're not asking you to, do, you know, I can't ask them to do anything, but what I can do and what I um, often will do is say, so, you, you know, you might want to look at this. So there's a couple of ways you can do it, but again, also what you'll find, though you may not know it, but large conferences, particularly those in D.C., will almost always have somebody from CMS present. They rarely make themselves known, but so they are trying to, they're trying to keep on top of that. And then, you know, the utilization management, so there's, there are programs that have, that have local organizations in each state um, will also be working on it. So I think CMS is trying very, very hard to innovate and is, you know, again, if you think about those curves, that, that need to continue the downward, the flattening, if not the bending down, is, is very real, particularly as you're anticipating the rise in the Medicare population due to the boomers moving through combined with the, um, with the increased longevity. So, you know, we have a number of things, and I would say at the very least, if you have something you think is, is really good and is really right, send it to the coverage group and send it to me and I'll forward it on up. And if, if I think that there might, you know, sometimes we'll just ask, like, who is the person who might find this interesting? So there's always somebody who will find it interesting, whether they will act on it or not. Is, and sometimes they won't tell you. You won't hear anything, and then all of a sudden you'll read something like that it just sort of happened. Um, an example, actually, of something very real happening is early on in my career, I was working with a friend of mine, Robert Morgan, and we were, we were looking at how to identify Hispanics. I was living in Miami at the time, and if you look at Miami, according to Medicare, it's about 50, it's majority white with some blacks and about eight Hispanics, which anyone who's ever been to Miami knows that's not right. And so we did this surname match, and we actually did a survey you see, I do do surveys, and we asked people, like, are you Hispanic? And we actually asked, are you, in give? and then we tried to figure out whether our surname match worked. And we did it for Florida and our other areas we did our survey, and it was picked up, and they ended up hiring RTI to validate it nationally. And that's now the variable that's in the Medicare summary file, Benny summary file. So those things do get picked up. Um, it's, it's kind of haphazard a little bit? Yes. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I know you have a couple of MDs on your team. Yes. My question on the clinical studies, how do you know you're looking at enough variables that are associated with what you're looking at to ensure that your conclusions are, are relevant? Let me give you a couple of examples on the things you did. Um, the medication, the androgen therapy, uh, it dropped off in the low risk patients. But did the physicians look at in that circumstance, was it a class 2B or a 3 indication in a low risk patient and a class 1 in a high risk metastatic patient? In which case, no matter what the cost effect, it would be continued to be used in, in the high risk patient medically because that's the right thing to do for your patients. It may really not be necessarily the right thing to do. It was practice at the time in a low risk patient. The other ones are hip nailings. Um, what, what is the current, you know, there's screws and nails. And I'm not an orthopod, so I can't take it. What is the current number one recommendation? Perhaps now it is nails, 15 years ago, it was screws. Are the old surgeons doing what they learned and still using screws? The young guys all using nails. Or I'll give you another iteration on that. Are the academic centers and the teaching centers using nails because they don't pay as much attention to cost as do private community centers, where cost is a huge factor. So I think those are all really good points. And I'm going to start with sort of one of them, which is, so in fact, in the case of the, the AST, it really was a class one versus a class, like, they basically not recommended at all. But the question was, we have, we have plenty of examples where just because something is recommended doesn't mean it's not price sensitive. And that was actually our worry is, this was absolute recommendation, and the question was, but is it price sensitive so that the price sensitivity got in the way of what was right? And that was, that was actually his concern. So Sean Elliott is a urologist, and so on every one of my teams, I always have 
somebody who's the right specialist. And we, they sort of do two things. Part of it is that if, if I can't, if my work isn't credible for that area of specialty, one, it'll, it'll never get published, and so then I've just wasted a ton of time. But also, I've like missed the point. So it's just another paper in a journal. Now maybe it doesn't change anything anyway, but it would be even worse if it, if it didn't do anything. So Mark Swinkowski, who's the chair of our Department of Orthopedics, helped out on the nail and, sc and screw paper. So he was very, in fact, we had three orthopedic surgeons on that paper. So that's part of what I do. Now they do two things for a PhD researcher. One is they check, the rea they're a reality check. Like, is this in fact right? And sometimes there'll be things we have decided not to study, like bariatric surgery. So everyone's very interested in bariatric surgery. The problem is you are required to have an ICD-9 code of high BMI in order to get the surgery. You are not required to have your BMI coded if you don't need the surgery. So we've never been able to figure out what's the comparison population, which should be people who are equally obese but didn't get the surgery. And so we have plenty of bariatric surgeons who want to know. So we've talked about, well, let's look at other variation within this, like is there a device variation among those who got it? But so there's this reality of if we can't measure, so we'll say, well, what is the important thing? So oftentimes with cancer, it's surgical margins. Well, we don't have a measure in SEER or in Medicare for surgical margins. So we can't distinguish between somebody who got a reoperation for positive margins and somebody who had positive margins but wasn't reopt, right? So we just don't study that. But the other piece that they will do is we will often do these groups of papers so that there will be some that have like the most clinically relevant questions for them where I will make sure the methods are solid and the results are presented right and they will be put in a clinical context. And then for my papers, which are much more about the healthcare system. They think they're a little goofy, but they're used to me. But what they will do is they will read it over and ask whether it's clinically credible and accurate and written in a way and answer those simple questions. And we'll often, I'll often vet my papers across other colleagues um, from different disciplines because I'd rather know early that there's a question I'm answering than figuring it out when I get it back from a journal editor. So that's how I do with it. So I agree with you completely. And I think that's my understanding, that's how your group works, is that it's all multidisciplinary teams, and this is why those teams are, end up being successful, as your group is, is because you, you solve these problems collaboratively and you solve them early rather than figuring it out when you get re rejected by your fourth journal because of some, some mistake that you could have figured out had you asked the right person the right question. I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's what we do, and there are plenty of ideas that we have elected not to study because we can't figure out how to actually control for the things we really care about. Other questions? Snack time? So thank you.